I'm Christine Hall. So, you know, I was thinking today, we, today is July 1st, so happy National Post Workers Day. And um, it got me thinking about annual wellness visit. I don't know how the correlation between the two came about, um, but I do know that uh, we've reached that midpoint within the year. And so those patients of yours that haven't come in to have their annual wellness visit, it's a great opportunity to reach out to them and see what's happening with them this latter part of the year Go into it. So uh, I love the annual wellness visit. I, I think it's the underdog. I don't think that the annual wellness visit is actually utilized in its best opportunity there. So I thought we would chat about it. Now we only have a little bit of time to chat today. So I'm going to just kind of touch on some of those major components of the annual wellness visit. So what is the intent of the annual wellness visit? And what documentation do you need to have um, for that annual wellness visit? Remember that this is a super great way to paint a picture of your patient's physical and social health. And so it's, it's also a great way to capture your MIPS, to capture any HEDIS measures while you have that patient in there for the, the annual wellness visit. It's not a physical exam. It's not an annual exam. It is an annual wellness visit. And we need to make sure that we're talking to our patients um, so that they know what the expectation is. This is not a physical exam like you had back when you were working and your, your commercial insurance provided you with that physical exam. This is an annual wellness visit where we're really gonna discuss how you're doing, um, again, from a different perspective, right? Um, it's a great revenue source for practices. The initial annual wellness visit reimburses about $175 and the subsequent visit also reimburses about $140. Now those prices differ depending upon what MAC you're in. So please check with your MAC uh, to see what that actual reimbursement is. Um, and during the public health emergency, annual wellness visits can be performed via telehealth. Be very careful because remember now that uh, we've lifted all of our audits and the OIG has really been putting out in their work plan their audit uh, views there, we're going to be seeing a lot of services that may have been provided via telehealth being audited to make sure all the documentation components have been met. So let's talk about those components because annual wellness visit is one of those. Remember last week we talked about a Medicare benefit. Incident two was a Medicare benefit. Annual wellness visit is a Medicare benefit. So it is its own benefit category. And annual wellness visit is an all or none type of visit. So again, it's not that you can do some of the components of annual wellness visit and get reimbursed or, you know, maybe you're doing a few other things on that day. You need to make sure that the annual wellness visit, all the components that are required are met and they're met in documentation. So again, those of you that have been working for your docs for a really long time and you know what they mean when they document this or when they use that template, it's really meant to be something else. Got to make sure that the quality of that document is there. So need to start off with that health risk assessment. Now the health risk assessment is, is a series of questions that are asked to the patient. Um, sometimes it is in a paper form that you give to the patient and they fill out. Maybe during their registration, you gave them access to this form to fill out. Shouldn't take more than about 20 minutes. Shouldn't be worded um, technically. It should be in layman's terms so a patient can understand. And it really should cover specific information like their demographic data. Demographic, I don't mean just their address, but like where do they live? Are they in an assisted living facility? Maybe a 55 and older community? Do they live with family members? Like what, what's going on with them demographically? Where do they, look, they live, right? Um, their health status. It should include things like their social, psychosocial risk. So how are they feeling? Are they depressed? Are they lonely? Are they angry? Are they in pain? Do they experience fatigue? Maybe what they're doing, we'll look at some of those behavioral risks. Are they smoking? Are they physically active? Are they using their silver sneaker membership? Um, how are they doing? Do they consume alcohol? You know, maybe 
maybe they have a boyfriend or two. You know, we do live in, I live in South Florida. In South Florida, we have a very active retirement community, very active retirement community. So, you know, that might be something we need to talk to the patients about. Should also include their activities of daily living. So how are they doing all of the things that they are doing? Are they dressing themselves, feeding themselves? Are they doing their own housekeeping? Which doesn't necessarily mean anything because I don't do my own housekeeping, you know. Just going to be honest with you there, not my favorite thing to do. Um, I'd rather code e &M or cardiology than clean the house. But that's another conversation, guys. Anyway, so do they do their own laundry? Do they do their own shopping? Are they handling their own finances? So these things are really important. If your provider doesn't know what to include in the um, health risk assessment, the CDC published a wonderful guide called the Framework to a Patient-Centered Health Risk Assessment. And that can help you develop your own health risk assessment for your patient population. You know, again, if you're living in a community like South Florida, we have a lot of one-level houses here. Maybe our risk assessment doesn't need to be, what floor are you on? You know, who knows? Anyway, things like that. So that is a major component of the annual wellness visit. They have to, you have to have these questions answered, that health risk assessment. And again, it could be that you had a chat with the, with the patient that included all of these issues and that are documented, or that you actually gave them a health risk assessment form for them to complete, and you scan that into the chart. So the next thing is establishing their medical and family history, which that might not be hard if this is an established patient to the practice, right? We might already have those medical conditions that are hereditary, that maybe mom had hypertension and dad had prostate cancer. Um, maybe there are some siblings that have some genetic disorders. Should I say that out loud? I don't know. Um, I always thought my siblings had genetic disorders. Turned out that that was actually part of their personality. So um, I don't know that that would be necessary for that health risk assess or for that patient's family history. But anyway, uh, how about any operations that the patient may have had? Allergies, injuries, treatments. And that, again, depending on whether this is a new patient to the practice or an established patient, it might already be in the chart. Uh, how about a list of medications and supplements? So, you know, again, we're coming, most of our, our elderly population, they are taking some supplements, some vitamin D, maybe some calcium, you know. Let's see what's going on. Hopefully they're all taking their their Centrum multivitamins in the morning and, and uh, they're doing that. But it is important for us to know because, again, some medications might be sensitive to those supplements. Um, another thing that we must capture in documentation is a list of the patient's current providers and suppliers. So who do they normally interact with? What pharmacy do they go to? How about, do they have any DME? Do they walk with a cane? Because I bet if they walk with a cane, they bought it somewhere. Sometimes it'd still be the same pharmacy, but maybe they have a particular DME supplier that they use. How about home health care? Maybe they have a home health aide that comes out to help them out, and that might be another resource that we could reach out to if we needed information about that particular patient. How about their specialists? You know, most of our, our older population or our retired population, they most of them have it one, a specialist or two. I know that here in South Florida, most of our patients have a dermatologist because, you know, we have the sun and the sand and it's good to get your skin checked for those, those little lesions. We never know what they might be. But other important issue could also be behavioral health providers. So that could give us an insight as to where that patient stands from a mental health perspective. So a list of their current providers and suppliers, right? Then we need to look at their cognitive impairments that this patient may or may not have, okay? And, and um, so a cognitive function view, it could be done either by observation, it could be a conversation with the patient, family members, caregivers. Um, it could also be a brief cognitive test, like using the mini cog or the IQ code. And there's a lot of samples of those types of tools that are available either through the National Institute of Aging, um, all aging and Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, or maybe the Dementia Resource for Professionals website. So there's a couple of resources out there. And um, we plan to give you a list of these resources in the description box on YouTube. So after this 
little coding and coffee that we have together if you want to go to the YouTube page and maybe watch this again because it's a lot of information or maybe you want to check out some of these links that we're offering that you can use you can gather some resources to put together um, another thing that we want to consider for cognitive impairments are what chronic conditions or other factors might they have that could contribute to an increased cognitive impairment. So maybe the patient has a diagnosis of Parkinson's and that would be something we want to keep an eye on. Um, another component, a mandatory component of the annual wellness visit is reviewing a patient's potential depression risk factors. So we want to make sure we're looking at maybe their past or their current experiences with depression or maybe any other mood disorders. You can use a standardized screening tool like a PHQ-9 or maybe the Beck's depression inventory to gather this information. So there's another link there for you for the depression assessment um, instruments. It's a website that can give you some additional screening tools or provide you with that PHQ-9 or the BEX to, to do that depression screening for this patient. Remember that these are just tools and that these tools, they have to be analyzed. They have to be reviewed by the provider so that they can determine if there's any intervention that might be needed for this patient. Another component of the annual wellness visit is going to be the patient's functional ability and level of safety. And so again, we're reviewing that health risk assessment to kind of help guide what we're going to be doing with this patient. Um, it could, we can also detect functional ability by direct observation, but of course that needs to be documented in the patient's record there. So we should be looking for some safety issues like how do they perform their activities of daily living? You know, if they're not able to uh, go from one level of their house to another level of their house, or they're not able to go to the grocery store, um, some of those things could be dangerous for them. Maybe they're not even using seat belts in the car, which I think everybody does now use a seat belt. But, you know, it's important to know what are their safety risks? What are their fall risks? How about hearing impairment? Um, what did you say? You said hearing impairment? Just kidding. So again, as we get older, a natural progression is that our hearing kind of decreases a little, our vision gets a little awkward. Anybody ever experienced the 40-year-old curse where you woke up after your 40th birthday and you couldn't see? You couldn't read the menu in front of you? Whoa. Um, and again, some home safety issues. If a patient does have a, a bathroom where they don't have any grips or any, any of those bars to hold on to getting in and out, as we get older, we need those types of things. Um, also should be documented what type of intervention is needed. You know, hi, Mrs. Smith, I think you need to get a handyman in because the handyman needs to put up some of those safety bars in the shower for you. So again, it's reviewing all of these issues that are for the patient. Again, this is not a physical exam, is it, guys? No, this is an actual sit down and have a conversation and see how the patient's doing. Let's really put together a plan of how we can keep that patient safe for the next year. We can keep that patient healthier for the next year. Things to identify, resources to provide to a patient. Um, new in 2021 is another requirement. This is a requirement now to review any current opiate prescriptions. You know, we have a major opiate problem in this country, and I believe that healthcare is now trying to become part of the solution. So we need to identify if the patient's taking any current opiate prescription. Review any opiate use disorder risks that they might have. You know, have they had a recent surgery? Have they had a recent fall? What's happened with them? Um, we need to evaluate their current pain level to make sure that we don't, the patient's not describing that maybe they're having a pain of eight out of 10 every day. Uh, and that might put them at risk of, of opiates, of having to use opiates. Um, make sure that we're talking to our patients about non-opiate treatments, physical therapy, maybe going to the gym, maybe a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is an option there. Or if it is a patient that has some pain issues that we're referring them out to the proper pain management person. So when we talk about pain management, the HHS Pain Management Best Practice Interagency Task Force put out a great report on how to intervene for that patient and provide them with some different options.
Another 2021 requirement that was added to the annual wellness is an actual screening for substance use disorders. So the patient's risk factors for substance use disorders, you know, um, again, now we have a lot of different types of substances out there. You know, maybe we can look at this patient and see if they have four or five drinks a night maybe there's a, a need for intervention there, right? It could be, no, I'm just saying, right? This is just a screening that's necessary. Um, you don't have to use a tool, but if you wanna use a tool, there are tools available like the TAPS tool to kind of screen for these potential substance use disorders. Um, you can find more information from the National Institute on Drug Abuse Screenings and Assessment Tools. So there's a link there for you. Again, these links will all be provided to you on YouTube when this is uploaded for, for um, restreaming. So another major component of the annual wellness visit is establishing a written screening. So again, this is a screening that we're gonna put in place for maybe the next five to 10 years. You know, Medicare offers a wide range of preventive services for these patients, and most of them are at no cost at all. So we have mammograms, colonoscopies, the low-dose scan, a CT scan for smokers, or how about a cholesterol screening? All of these things that are available to these patients, we should be looking at. Um, not today because we have a limited amount of time, but on another day, I would love to chat up about all of those preventive services, some of those that can be provided in your office, especially on the same day as an annual wellness visit, right? So we can get some of these preventive services out. And, you know, again, it's good medicine for the patient. It's part of the benefits that are offered to them through Medicare, but it's also a good uh, source of revenue that we could develop a good annual wellness program, not just the visit, but a program that encompasses all of those preventive services that are available to the patient. So again, a written screening of what is the expectation for the next five to 10 years of those screening services, mammos, um, colonoscopies, things like that. Um, we also need to put together a list of those patient risk factors. So kind of in order there, those things that were uncovered during the assessments that we did or the screenings that we did. So what is their mental health condition? Do they have depression and what are we going to do about it, right? That needs to be documented. How about substance use disorders or the cognitive impairments there? Any of those risk factors that were identified? We need to qualify, all, quantify all of those together and put together a treatment option or anything that is a uh, benefits that it would would be for that patient you know again maybe we're going to refer them to some community programs that they can participate in so that's when we're going to really put together that personalized health advice for the patient we're going to provide them with those resources. So again, if it's a community-based thing, maybe they're obese and we wanna refer them to Weight Watchers, right? We should make sure that that's documented and provided to the patient. We wanna make sure that maybe they, if they need any nutritional counseling that we're able to provide them with a, a, a nutritionist or refer them to a nutritionist. How about smoking cessation? I know that in the state of Florida, they offer right from the state department, they'll offer smoking cessation options like in patches and gum and things like that to a particular patient. So we wanna make sure that we are putting together a personalized inventory of referrals for this particular patient. And this needs to be documented in the chart and available to give to the patient, right? So we send them off with, empower them to go off and get these different resources that we have been referred to them. So um, now when we talk about providing the patient with something, either we could give them a printout of today's visit that has all of that information on it. That would be a good idea. Another resource that could be is that some of our EMRs do summaries of the visit uh, and a summary could be provided that includes those resources that we gave the patient. Um, and also maybe the patient has access to the patient portal. Now that's a really good resource to make sure that we discuss with the patient. If you want a copy of today's visit, we can either print it to you on checkout or you can always access it from the portal. And documenting that we encourage the patient to use the portal, well, there's those 
MIPS and HEDIS measures, right, that we were, especially that MIPS that we're, we're supporting that interoperability. So very important that we touch on that. Um, during the annual wellness visit, this is a super opportunity to talk about the patient's advanced care planning or what are their advanced directives. Now, it's not included in the annual wellness visit, right, but it can be performed during the annual wellness visit, and it would be at no cost to the patient during the annual wellness visit. So we're going to talk about their living will, their advanced directives, maybe the, who's their health care proxy. Maybe we talk about do they have a, a health care power of attorney, you know, that document that appoints, appoints a person um, to take care of their medical treatment in a time when they can't take care of it themselves, when they can't make decisions for themselves. There is an entire annual, uh, excuse me, advanced care planning worksheet that's available to you from CMS. And so there's a link here, but there's also going to be that link um, in the YouTube later on. Now, the advanced care discussion between the provider and the patient, and this is to talk to them about preparing these documents. Um, discussing what future decisions might need to be made with the patient. Let them know about the different kinds of care preferences they might have and caregiver information. This conversation needs to be at least 30 minutes and it needs to be face to face in order to report it. So documentation should include the time that was spent with the patient going over their advanced care planning and what exactly was discussed during advanced care planning. Remember, if a payer were to look at it, they would want to see what took 30 minutes to discuss with this patient. So there needs to be some quality in documentation of what was discussed. The advanced care planning reimburses about $90 for that advanced care planning timing with the patient. And then each additional 30 minutes that's spent with the patient is about $80. Again, check with your MAC to see specifically what that reimbursement might be. Um, subsequent annual wellness visits don't include a depression screening. And so if the depression screening is performed in those subsequent visits, don't forget to report those visits, uh, the, the, the uh, depression screening with the patient. Depression screening, again, I'm going to remind you, is that particular code when reported, um, not included in the annual wellness visit for those subsequent, they also do have a time component, and that time component should be documented, how much time was spent with the patient on that day performing that, that depression screening. So um, again, we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk about this together, but I wanted to go over some of those components of annual wellness visit with you. And now let's take some questions and answers. You know, I know that was a lot I laid down on you about annual wellness. And I want to I wanna answer any questions that you might have. Now, if you would like, um, we are planning to upload a, a, an actual presentation on annual wellness visits. If an annual wellness program is something that you want to implement in your practice, or maybe you want to come in and support the annual wellness program in your practice, again, having all of these tools either built into your EMR, or maybe, you know, you have a specific person that you use to do annual wellness visits in your office, and not just annual wellness. Think about it as a program. Think about it as all the other services that can be provided to your patients when you're when you're performing that annual wellness visit how about all of those um those other services those other preventive services that can be done in your office if you do so we have the the in, intensive behavioral therapy for obesity um, that can be done or cardiovascular diseases that can be done and again that's just adding that to your particular program um, i have a question here from caitlin the advanced care planning Yes, yeah, so she says, I thought advanced care planning time could be billed starting at 16 minutes. Has that changed? It has not changed, Caitlin. The description of the code says that it is for the first 30 minutes. And we do know that through, through um, we are allowed to start reporting that particular service at the halfway mark because it's listed as an evaluation and management service. And any of our evaluation and management services um, can that, that have a time component with the exception of office 
and other outpatient services. So carve those out, guys, are other services that have a time requirement. Once we've met that halfway point, then we are able to report that service. But again, it must be documented in the medical records. So you have to make sure that your providers are documenting the time for all of those timed components. Um, Lavon Saitis says, I am a cardiology coder. God love you, honey, because that is a challenge on its own. And I noticed that we have patients who come to see our providers for a cardio well visit. Is any, is that any specific documentation needed? Okay, again, if it's a Medicare patient, Medicare doesn't cover preventive service. Uh, preventive services like that so that they don't cover that that annual cardio wellness exam they do cover an annual wellness exam and and usually that is performed by their primary care physician so what i think might your cardiologist might be doing is those patients that already have a cardiac condition maybe they're bringing them in annually to assess how that cardiac condition is is progressing and so that's not necessarily preventive because they already have a cardiac condition that's being managed either managed through observation through medication through diet and exercise and they're bringing them in so i don't know again without looking at your documentation i don't know exactly what your provider means by that cardio wellness visit um, i would assume again because it's cardiology specific that that patient has a cardiac problem that they're seeing that cardiologist for. That kind of makes sense to me. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions about the annual wellness visit? So let's see, um, it looks like Caitlin said, Caitlin's got some things here. We had providers get confused because the annual wellness can be billed telehealth but not the ippe so i have to check that um, again if you caitlin if you go to the cms website and uh, look for telehealth the most updated telehealth list is there and it will advise you whether the ippe can or cannot be done via telehealth again again i off the top of my head i couldn't answer you that but give me a minute or two and i and i might be able to or i'll get back to you i, I know how to reach you caitlin i can get back to you with the documentation on on the IPPE, which is different than the annual wellness visit. Today, we're just talking about the annual wellness visit. Um, let's see, are there any other questions that are coming in? I know we've got a lot of you on today. I'm so glad to see everybody joining us for Coding and Coffee. Um, don't forget that we do a poll once a week to see what you want to discuss for coding and coffee. And at this point in, in our presentation, we don't have any specific sessions lined up. So we're very suggestive, of course, if you want to um, request something specifically. Hey, Christine, I want you to talk about um, maybe let's talk about those preventive services that, that we see patients have, or maybe, hey, Christine, uh, let's talk about lesion removals or whatever it is you want to talk about. So, um, so Caitlin, you, you mentioned there that it, it cannot be billed as a telehealth because it requires a vision screening. I agree with you, Caitlin, but Medicare has added it during the public health emergency to the telehealth services. So again, um, I don't think that they'll continue to have an annual wellness after the fact. I think that um, it'll probably go away. And, but you know, we'll have to see how all of this turns out. This is all, this was all new to us last year when, when the pandemic hit. So we're all playing it out, but I'd love to have this conversation with you more about annual wellness visit, because it is one of my passions, um, annual wellness visit. So. Uh, we had someone pop in. My good friend Marjean popped in and she said, I'd like more ENM, please. Absolutely. So what we can do is also have another ENM come in um, and, and and we can take a look at that, maybe break it into some smaller pieces and digest it a little clearer. You know, there's it's new. It's new to all of us. So we're all learning. Um, Caitlin also says that she would like to know the difference between, she would like some more information about biopsy versus excisions. I would love to tackle that, Caitlin. I love derm. Um, I, you know, I love everything. Uh, spinal arthrodesis. Well, I don't love spinal arthrodesis, Sabrina, but you know what? 
I do like ENM with spinal arthrodesis, and I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit further. So um, it, it, it really is wonderful that they're able to help patients out. I'm very familiar with arthrodesis. Um, let's see, we have uh, Lavance says, these are patient referred for abnormal EKGs from urgent care. The providers are tilting these visits as cardio wellness. Oh, well, I see that. Uh, but they are coming to you with a cardiac diagnosis that does need evaluation and management. So I think that might be what they're trying to do, and they're just giving it a fancy name. Um, again, I don't know. We'll, we'll have a chance to, well, maybe we should uncover some of those. Reach out to me offline. Um, we've come to the end of our time together, my friends. Again, uh, I'll see you next week for Coding and Coffee. I hope that you reach out and let us know what you want to talk about. I've got some really great recommendations this week. Uh, you'll see us on social media. Please like us on YouTube and like us in our social medias. And we will see you next week. Have a great 4th of July, by the way. And happy Postal Workers Day. And, and, uh, and be safe out there. Okay, guys? Take care.